Cohen. I'm with uh, Zaria Capital, the sovereign wealth fund of the government of Malaysia. And I welcome you to this panel. Appreciate you all coming out this afternoon. Uh, as the last event before the cocktail hour. Um, I'd like to let my fellow uh, panelists begin with introducing themselves, uh, a little about their background and the kinds of things that, that each of us looks for when we're making investments. Um, you may note that the uh, panelists have changed since the programs were published, so uh, some, not all of the bios will be in there. So, uh, Larry, could you start, please? I thought the measurement stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, that mic doesn't work. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Larry Cohen. I'm with Zaria Capital. Uh, I'm with uh, Zaria Capital. Uh, I'm with Zaria Right. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Larry Tsai, and I'm an executive, executive director of a business development at Fusang Pharma. Uh, primarily, my role at Fusang is for uh, in licensing base stage, but uh, you know, in keeping with the theme of RESI, and uh, what they asked me here is, you know, we also look at uh, some early stage technology in terms of uh, platforms, and also my previous uh, opportunity. Uh, work at Chico Pharma, we look at a lot of uh, early stage uh, assets, so uh, we'd like to, you know, have the, really appreciate the opportunity to share some of those uh, uh, world stories and the lessons learned uh, with everyone. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Yao Ho. Uh, I uh, born and raised in California, so I'm a local Californian, but, uh, uh, and uh, trained as a biomedical engineer, and, uh, but specifically at Life Capital. I won't give you my life story now here, but uh, uh, at Life Capital, we were founded in 2015 uh, under the premise of uh, investing in, uh, our first fund was focused on investing in late stage healthcare companies in China and helping them bri bridge cross border partnerships, specifically with US companies. Um, uh, that worked very well for us. We were able to raise a first fund of 300 million, which we deployed in about a year and a half. And in uh, 2017, we raised a second fund of 420 million. Uh, in, uh, and we're currently deploying out of that fund. And now we invest in U.S. companies as well, uh, early stage, as early as pre-IND, which we, just, we recently just made an investment in, in a Bay Area company, and uh, which is very promising. Uh, we just met them on the, on the streets and they were saying, hey, there's some interesting news. But, um, uh, but I think the general idea is, in terms of strategics, our objective is help our portfolio companies with cross-border partnerships, regardless of whether or not you're a U.S. or Chinese company. And uh, and I think uh, and now that Chinese companies are going more and more upstream, it's it's a perfect place to look. So uh, I'll leave it there. Hi everyone, my name is XQ. I'm with Esco Group and Esco Ventures. The uh, parent company is a Singapore-based uh, life science tools, uh, medical di medical devices, diagnostics. Uh, a solution provider. We have over a thousand employees. We are operating worldwide. U.S. headquarters outside of Philadelphia, uh, global headquarters in Singapore, and uh, yeah, manufacturing and, and R&D you know worldwide. Uh, Esco Ventures is the uh, corporate venture and life science investment arm. So uh, as yeah, we initially started, you know, kind of typical corporate venture, uh, yeah, investing in devices, um, uh, some diagnostics, mainly life science tools, you know, uh, with a strategic mandate. Obviously, you know, um, being a Asia headquartered business, you know, a lot of uh, cross-border opportunities we can, uh, cross-border strategies we can implement to uh, support our portfolio companies. So that has been the first, you know, uh, primary mandate and very successful uh, financially and also strategically. Uh, secondly, we uh, see an emerging opportunity in uh, Singapore and the uh, surrounding countries. We have uh, great science, talent, capital. So we put together an incubation platform we call Esco Ventures X uh, as of about a year ago. Uh, we have uh, three biotech companies, uh, still kind of in stealth mode. We're going to take the wraps up on some of them this year. Uh, basically, it's um, yeah, it's it's uh, at the intersection of the novel biological insights, uh, mainly platform technologies, and obviously unmet medical needs. And then we put together these, you know, we seed and we found and we seed and we we staff, we staff uh, these early stage biotech companies uh, with the aim to either bring them to the U.S. or China. Uh, and then last but not least, we have a particular interest in uh, women's health and fertility across drugs, devices. Uh, diagnostics, digital health. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity and looking forward to uh, having this dialogue with everyone this afternoon. Hi, my name is Nigel Williams and uh, I uh, do a lot of investing out of India. So, we, I represent a family office over there. 
$5 billion company. Uh, Indian investing is a little different than uh, some of the other countries. Our, uh, our process often involves a guru, a poet, and an astrologer to, to determine uh, whether, and I'm not joking, uh, I'm not, and, and the uh, family I represent with the 74th richest, and now they're the 11th richest, so I recommend getting an astrologer, guru, and po poet for your, re for your investment decisions. Uh, we, we, uh, family offices in emerging countries look to make money in different categories, so it could be anything from cement to ballpoint tips to newsprint. Um, we've made some healthcare investments. We've made uh, a lot of natural product investments in other countries. We've invested in some ride-sharing things, so a very, very broad spectrum. We have uh, seven hospitals, which are the biggest hospitals in the region in eastern India, 200 pharmacies. So it's a perfect uh, uh, ground for us to develop and implement different um, health tech products over there. So we use it as my uh, little training ground to, to try different things in India. India, the average age in India is 23 years old, as opposed to China, which I believe is 47. So you can imagine there's quite an advantage that India is going to have over the years with a, such a young population of early adopters that take on technologies. You know, they, they, there's, there's no learning curve, they just take something right away. So, very interesting country. Um, the, I, I see myself as a bridge between the Western world and try and transculturate how things will, can work in India. I see there's a technology gap that's fast closing. Um, you know, they were 15 years behind on e-commerce. Now they're catching up. We saw the Flipkart deal with Walmart, $16 billion. So that's kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to the possibility and scale of India. Um, but digital health is something that can definitely take off big time in India. The government is behind it. The Prime Minister of India, Modi, has promised healthcare for half a billion people, but has no way of really providing it from a money point of view or even a, a, a personnel point of view. So all kinds of health technologies that can help uh, um, optimize health delivery will be welcome in India. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, Bruce Cohen and I'm an advisor to Zarai Capital. It is the life sciences investment unit of the Malaysian Government Sovereign Fund. Uh, we're based in Malaysia. We invest globally uh, in healthcare. Uh, all we do is healthcare. We are by and large sector agnostic, um, and we tend to do mid-stage companies. Uh, we occasionally do early stuff, but uh, our sweet spot is mid-stage companies. Uh, we'll put anywhere from five to thirty million dollars into the deal. Uh, the majority of our portfolio is in North America and Europe. But like everybody else, we're looking uh, very aggressively for opportunities to uh, move technology across borders uh, and invest more heavily in the developing markets of Asia. Um, so, and we will have questions at the end um, and a chance for you to sort of smuggle a pitch into a question, if you like, uh, if you're out raising money. Um, and. Uh, but I'd like to sort of pose a couple of questions because I think everybody comes to these events and thinking, well, let's just go across the border. We'll go find some dumb money in, in some part of the world, Asia, the Middle East, whatever, and, and see if we can get some valuation we can't get in the United States or Europe or find some magic solution to a product that, that, that doesn't work. So uh, I'd like to ask my fellow panelists to sort of uh, share some of their experience with, with what really works when you're talking about a cross-border transaction where, by and large, you've got technology from one particular place and you're looking for investors and partners in other parts of the world. Um, and if someone wants to start, that's fine, or we can just go down the line starting with Larry. I'm happy to take that. Um, I think it's very important to understand that the Healthcare systems are very different. Yeah, India, Southeast Asia, China, uh, Europe, and the U.S. and the payment systems are quite different. And so, what technology you might have, you know, uh, looking into uh, something, you know, with the U.S. lens, you know, it, it may not necessarily work in China, right? Uh, for example, in the U.S., in therapeutics, big focus on uh, often drugs, you know, rare disease for obvious reasons, right? Um, however, you know, uh, in spite of uh, their finally last year being a uh, an official list. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we will have uh, 
high prices for uh, orphan drugs in China anytime soon. It, uh, the system is just, yeah, not, not really geared up to it. Of course, China changes so fast, so never say never. Um, in terms of uh, a lot of the health tech opportunities that we see here in the US, it's, it's not really our expertise, or so maybe some of our, my fellow panelists can comment. Uh, but it seems to me, you know, this is um, yeah, very US, you know, US uh, context dependent and even culturally dependent. Uh, it may not necessarily work, you know, in, in, uh, in a market like India. Yeah. The, the, the unmet needs, you know, are, I mean, the medical unmet needs, they, they obviously pass, they cross borders, but then the unmet needs, you know, when, when looking into how things are being paid for and how, how physicians work and, you know, how the workflows work, yeah, they, they can be quite different. Uh, so, so in terms of finding a partner in China, or uh, I think first and foremost with any of these countries, I mean, uh, not not to not to be very not to be speak negatively of these countries, but they're they're all pretty messy if you want to enter yourself. So you definitely would need to find a partner. But when you do try to find a partner, you need to find a partner that you trust. And building the building the trust aspect, I would say, I'm, I'm, like, uh, I'm sure these guys know more more about that aspect in, in their respective countries. But in China, trust plays a major part of, of the relationship you build. So, so it's also just just to make sure nothing 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 inappropriate happens in the relationship. But but frankly speaking, I mean the, the two messages. If you were to take home with something, I would just say find a person you trust, and then uh, uh, make sure uh, find a person you trust, and then uh, pretty much find a person you trust, right? So. <laughs> Just uh, expanded on what uh, Yao just said, you know, how do you build the trust and this is something you really need to invest a little bit of your time and energy there. And uh, as uh, Bruce mentioned, you know, yeah, you can uh, look for some, you know, uh, not the kind of graduation you can get here and uh, uh, thinking you can get uh, overseas. And I won't say there is no opportunity like that. And uh, uh, I would say the investors are getting more sophisticated and also you uh, just uh, as you all mentioned you need to build this kind of a, a relationship uh, to trust uh, and uh, um, you won't hurt if you can hold your own liquor and uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's part of the culture and uh, uh, you know I'm all for that uh, nothing against that but also there is uh, something at the end of the day, you have to really just know the people you are going to be working with, unless you just want to take the money and run, and uh, that's a totally different story. But uh, I would say uh, also working, know where the, the money is uh, coming from and understand the time horizon, that's going to play a big role in, uh, in terms of the, uh, the background of those investors because of their uh, Experience they might have a different expectations and uh, understanding and uh, just the uh, time horizon than you would like to have and uh, to have that uh, communication up front and that will help uh, go a long way. Yeah, so one of the experiences of going to a developing country like India is you realize you need an ecosystem. You need, let's say, just signing an NDA. So if somebody comes in with a great idea, where is the jurisdiction of that NDA? Somebody doesn't want to be bound to the laws of Calcutta, and we don't want to be bound to the laws of uh, San Francisco. So how do you even sign an NDA? That These are like minor things that can end up being a, a big deal. So you need to un have legal people that help you out in these areas. You need to, you know, we've had a lot of uh, amazing startups that have uh, come over and they bring in the, the head of Ernst & Young and they do evaluation and they go, this company's worth nothing. And, and a, few, a few weeks later, they get a $100 million valuation with you know, pre-revenue because they don't have the ecosystem to value a, a startup. And it's incredibly frustrating. It's, change, it's changing over time and that's kind of been a lot of what I've built over there is the ec ecosystem that can value companies and can the, the, the mechanics for doing the deal. That's just sending money is, you know, they, they just funded a business I started and it took six months just to send the money, you know, and, and get access to it, to, to the US. So uh, these are things that, you know, need, need to be thought about before you do business in, you know, and I know 
countries like Singapore, Singapore is amazing for that. They've actually got around all those things, but India still is a little bit in the uh, backwater in those areas. But um, taking on the point you were saying about trust earlier, if if you go to actually any, any of the uh, Asian countries and think you're going to close a deal, that you're going to fly out there and you're like, well, I need to be there a week, I've got three meetings, you, you won't close that deal. You need to be there a month, maybe, maybe come back numerous times. You, you can't close a deal on a PowerPoint and a handshake and business projections. It's It really is spending time with the fam people's family, it's sitting people, it's getting to know them. Uh, they're surrounded by people that uh, do try and take advantage of them, so they want to know that you're not trying to take advantage of them, at least in India. It's taken me you know, many years to kind of build up a trust that if you recommend something, um, you know, it, it, can, it can be actionable. So it's not a it's not a uh, short-term proposition to try and raise money in these in these emerging markets. Yeah, I just want to say something about what Nigel said, and, and I'd like to borrow you uh, a couple of times a year. Um, the the cultural differences can be gigantic, or they can be tiny, but but they do drive you crazy. Um, our fund has a policy that we won't wire the cash until 12 business days after the documents are signed. So if you would like to come and tell our, our portfolio companies about six month delays, that would be terrific. It would make me a little more popular at the closing. And, and you find it when you're in an American syndicate and you tell them, uh, guys, there's just one little wrinkle in our process. We, we don't sign and wire the same day. And they go, sure, 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 because they think you're making it up. And then they go, where's the wire? And we go, well, 12 days. And they go, you can't do that because in American culture that isn't how deals get closed. And if you don't think about the, the sort of tiny things as well as the big things, um, you get yourself in a lot of trouble. And I think that's particularly a problem for, uh, more so for Americans than Europeans, because Europeans of a certain age know there used to be variations on the continent that have often moved away. And, and we don't think about that. And, and when you guys go looking for money in Asia, you have to be ready for that. And, and it is, you know, there are huge cultural differences on when, why, and how you sign an NDA, right? And right? I don't know how many of you ask. I always ask this when I'm on a panel, has anybody ever sued or been sued on an NDA related to an investment where jurisdiction mattered? First of all, no one's ever been sued and no one's ever filed a lawsuit. And then, but yet you can, we argue about whether our NDAs are under Malaysian law or Delaware law for a long time. And, and yet in Asia, no one cares because no one's going to sue and no one's going to come to China to sue you for an NDA infringement. And even if you sue in America, right, as an attorney here, the, the damages are, are incalculable. I don't mean incalculable high, I mean impossible to calculate. So you sue and then you get no judgment. And, and so when you try to peddle that in Asia, they look at you as if you were just being down from your starship, I think. And, and we see, you know, I'm an American, I see that all the time when I bring Americans to the, the Southeast Asia. It's just refusal to acknowledge that the world is not uh, created in America's image. And, and I would encourage you all to think and come from this setting to think a lot about that. We'll talk a little bit about sector differences in that, right? Because if you're in the pharmaceutical part of our business, you need the American market most of the time. It's probably changing because nobody spends money on drugs like we do. But what we challenge our portfolio companies with is if you're in devices, diagnostic services, digital, right? Is your business model sustainable without America? Uh, our president is teaching us that the world might be sustainable without America, but um, or in spite of America, depending on your politics. But but could you, you guys were nodding, so I want to spend a little time talking about when we look at different sectors, how we think about the importance of the American markets of the globe, and how we think about um, new products where. You see it in China, I've seen a lot of it in China. They have no plans to come to America because they don't need to. And, and that was unthinkable 10 years ago. 
Uh, I can take that a little bit and also put a little bit of uh, look at a different angle. From a food science perspective, yes, uh, primarily it's been you know, focusing on China and what we try to index is A stage assets, for instance, after phase two into phase three or in the phase three, uh, we primarily just look at China uh, as a geographic territory uh, for its application. Um, but for the, uh, you know, the, I, I kept going back to this analogy of when you look at uh, China, do not look at it as a snapshot of any given moment. Uh, instead, try to look at it as a, a motion picture still evolving. And uh, this is what happening with uh, Fuxian. When it, at first, it's uh, primarily in the uh, Chinese market, and then it, after acquiring uh, generic company called Glenn Pharmaceutical, they started looking at the uh, American market. And we we're setting up a Fusan Pharma USA actually already been set and looking to uh, bring the generic made either in China or by uh, Glenn Pharma in India to US market. For, uh, so that's a little bit different than what we have uh, talked about at the early stage, but I just want to put that in there so people keep that in mind that things could change and uh, we all know that 2018 has been, we have seen a lot of changes uh, for good or bad and uh, going back to the uh, early stage, I would say um, it will be a little bit different to just hold it into one specific uh, geographic territory and I would like to see something that could have an application for the global stage where you can really generate the, a lot of uh, interest and also that's where uh, you would have the maximum potential. Especially, uh, I think, you know, uh, as Q mentioned earlier about the uh, rare disease and, uh, you know, often drugs. That's something you look at it. If you look at something ultra rare, you have uh, maybe several hundred, up to several thousands worldwide. You cannot just say, I'm just looking at this uh, in North America, or is it? Because you will have a tough time uh, you know, just finding the patients if you limit it yourself. And uh, if you just, you know, open up your uh, eyes and the, the mind, and you just say where you can get the uh, most uh, market or help the most patient, I think that will help your company and also uh, your project. I don't know if that's uh, something you can get away. Yeah, here's a good point. So, so I think uh, to comment on China doesn't need other markets, I would say that's partially true, right? It's a lot of, uh, it's, uh, partially you could say it's the financial hubris in China, which is, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, prior, prior to joining Life Capital, I was with an organization called Yang Jibru Pharmaceutical Group. Uh, when I first joined, the revenues were, when I first joined, it was around 20, shoot, 2014, I think? 2014, 2013. Um, uh, yeah, 2013. Um, uh, their revenues were about 3.4 billion US dollars. Uh, in five years, they're now more than 10 billion US dollars in revenue. And uh, and they're a large, large pharmaceutical company, right? Like, other than how Gilead grew their growth, um, there, it's very difficult for other companies to have 20% year on year growth for such a large organization uh, uh, elsewhere, right? If you have to come to the US, you have to compete with all these other companies. Whereas in China, they understand the China market. Well, why should we go elsewhere, right? So, so there, were, there has been a bit of financial hubris in China, just because the growth rate of 20%, 30% year on year has been just so addictive. Now, it's not that might not be the case. It, no country can sustain that type of growth forever, but, uh, but, the growth, but I think in other countries, like in, like in these other countries uh, represented here, there's still a lot of opportunity for some pretty wild growth. And it takes a lot of foresight for them to come abroad to want to try a new business. Um, and, and now, now, going back to the, and I think rare disease is a great example that China, the Chinese government really doesn't, like, they, they can't even, they, frankly speaking, with 1.3 billion people, it's extremely difficult to manage the needs of 1.3 billion people. Look at the US, like, I mean, see, we have 300 million people and we're having issues, right? Like, left and right. So the real question is, what is the best way to address these issues on a macro scale, a, long, a lot larger macro scale, uh, and also appease everyone, right? And with respect to the rare disease, the Chinese government is trying to take a multi-pronged approach, right? Which is, they want to help everyone and support these local companies. 
banks. Now the question is how can they change internal rules and regulations, but without breaking the bank on, on supporting with these rare disease platform companies. And when you, when, uh, when uh, XQ uh, uh, mentioned the, the rare disease list, the Chinese government is trying to move toward, towards that direction, right? Um, which is uh, having a list of list of indications that would potentially be targeted, and the provincial government may, may reimburse. Definitely not not what the U.S. market is doing, but at, at a small fraction. But then, if you increase the population, if it is a rare disease that it, that where you have the same prevalence across the U.S. in China, it makes a lot more sense actually, because uh, in China, if you have a rare disease, a lot of people travel long distances just to go to one specific hospital. And one hospital, you capture 80% of the market, right? So uh, it really is dependent on, depend on strategy, but, uh, and, and I think that's what kind of makes China such a, such a unique market to, that might not be another one. But again, you still need foresight. So, so maybe I can go back to what Bruce was, uh, his opening uh, uh, theme, you know, on uh, the different segments. So clearly, you know, in the uh, category of novel therapeutics drugs, yeah, the world would not have, uh, New drugs, you know, without uh, without America, right? The, the American system and pricing, you know, is supporting, you know, and, and driving and providing the financial incentive, you know, for the uh, you know risky and you know expensive investments needed in the new drug development. Uh, so yeah, that's obvious, you know, in, in terms of drugs. In terms of um, uh, devices and diagnostics, um, yeah, obviously reimbursement, you know, can be challenging in in, in, in some instances in the U.S. Uh, maybe a little bit better with you know some of the uh, PMA you know therapeutic devices. Uh, we we have of course seen you know some uh, exits um, yeah even in some cases prior to a final FDA approval. Um, I think yeah there are big opportunities for device and diagnostic companies um, globally you know or even ex US. Uh, so yeah certainly big opportunities in Asia. In China as as many of you may know you know a lot of the homegrown device companies has been and, and the government's policies have been fostering uh, import substitution. Yeah, so in, yeah, you have you know, high-end, uh, expensive imported devices and, 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 the, and the Chinese government trying to uh, encourage local economic growth and there have been um, yeah, a large number of you know, local uh, device companies that have, have been able to, uh, yeah, in some cases, practically reverse engineer, work around the IP or you know, just yeah, reverse engineer you know, and uh, making, um, yeah, some, 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 it depends on the category as well. Sense, you know, yeah, as of a few years ago, it was like 70, 80% local. Obviously, high end, you know, medical imaging equipment still mainly, you know, yeah, foreign brand or, you know, or imported, you know, or at least in the, in the control of the, uh, the foreign brand. So, yeah, that is, um, that has been a, a very interesting in a growth sector. Uh, diagnostics, of course, yeah, can also be challenging, you know, in, in many contexts um, in the US due to the reimbursement. I think there's a big opportunity for diagnostics. Uh, obviously, in diagnostics, you need big sample in the validation. Uh, we have, you know, a uh, diagnostic company in our portfolio, you know, and we're mainly focusing on, on the Asian market. Uh, we, if we are able to collect, you know, uh, with that company, a large uh, amount of samples, high quality, you know, to validate, you know, these, uh, these diagnostic assays or these biomarkers that would be, I think, quite challenging in the US. Uh, in terms of digital health, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is quite, yeah, it, it seems to be quite, you know, country or region specific. I, I'm not so sure how much cross-border angles, you know, there are in, in, in these digital health uh, companies. Um, uh, we are particularly interested in digital therapeutics that are being developed like a drug, you know, getting high reimbursement in, you know, it, it, in the U.S. right now it's really taking off. I think we'll see the first uh, uh, exits, you know, of such uh, um, digital or, or IPOs or, you know, M&A, you know, for such digital therapeutics companies in the U.S. Uh, and then, yeah, this could lead, you know, the like for the rest of the world or other markets as well. Yeah. Again, yeah, maybe payment for digital therapeutics we, I'm, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how this payment is, is going to work in, in, in many other Asian countries. Yeah. So our, our uh, issues in India are a little different than other countries. It's not rare diseases, it's just basically access, access to healthcare, democratizing healthcare. And there's globally a world shortage of doctors, you know. Uh, most doctors you know, around 35 when they start making decent money and all their friends are now, you know, got two kids and it's kind of like, oh, I should have gone into banking, I should have gone into, you know, tech, I should have gone into other areas. So it's, it's we, we don't reward doctors very well globally. And, and so just a massive, massive shortage. And so in emerging countries, there's a brain drain of, uh, of trained doctors from India, certainly you would see Indian doctors anywhere in the world. Um, you know, they, they can make 10 times the money in Dubai, 
So why would they stay in their uh, in their in their town? It's the same everywhere. It's the same in the US. Uh, it's, it's the same everywhere. So uh, that's kind of the area we're looking at: is how do we optimize healthcare? How do we use technologies to deliver healthcare? And uh, you know, give give that to the to the population. We don't have to worry about insurance. We don't have to worry about Medicaid or or, or litigation. So we can actually move very quickly with trying different things. So which is one of the reasons why it's a very good testing ground for uh, healthcare over there. Whereas you know, in, in more developed countries, you have to you know go through so many different stages. Um, they do listen to the FDA. That is you know something people want to hear about HIPAA compliance. These things, but not not necessarily mandatory. Another interesting thing in India that is happening is uh, uh, how many people here know what Ayurveda is? What? Ayurveda. Ayurveda, yeah. Okay, one. Anybody else? Two. So I'll speak for the panel. All of us. Yeah. Okay. So it's a traditional in Indian uh, medicine that you know actually a lot of Western medicine is based on. Things like yoga, meditation, turmeric, even uh, aspirin is uh, Ayurvedic, ginger, green tea, you know, a lot of these things. So this actually is a rising area and nat natural medicines are actually really, uh, there was a company uh, recently that grew to a vast size, a billion dollars in a matter of years, peddling Ayurveda, so it wasn't, it wasn't um, so legitimate, but it, it grew to, you know, huge, huge size very quickly. So, natural remedies are something that are actually uh, fighting with uh, more Western medicines, and it's a form of uh, nationalism. And some of this uh, traditional medicines are very, very effective. I can personally speak for many of these things. You know, there's many people that believe turmeric is a cure for uh, uh, cancer, and I've had uh, taken different potions for di different issues. So. Going back to what we were saying earlier, you can't just come in and say we know what to do. We, you know, take this pill and you know, do this. Uh, you, you need to transculturate to to these different countries and understand their their sensitivities. You can't you can't just be. Uh, they're not. America has lost a little bit of its luster in being the world leader for all these things. People are now like looking more internally, and there's, you know, as we become more nationalistic, they become more nationalistic, and and there's a pride in their own country and. Pride in um, you know hey, you know what as you say we don't we don't need the American market we've got we've got this over here. Thanks, Ernest. Uh, I think when you come to these panels, um, you oftentimes walk away having spent 45 minutes of your life listening to a, what I would describe as a remarkable mastery of the obvious. Um, we all want products that address unmet medical need. We don't really think about the fact that's infinite, so therefore, by definition, it makes no sense. Um, we all want top-notch management teams, but sometimes you play the cards you can dealt. Um, we all want phase three assets with 10 million pre, uh, totally de-risk and a validated target um, with a billion dollar market. Um, but we don't get those, and, and so I, I, I struggle as, a, as an audience member and as a panelist is, is to help think about what you be able to come away with and say, I never heard that before. So I, I've asked the guys in, in advance to think a little about this. Um, I, if you could share one of your greatest catastrophes, uh, perfectly funny, um, and, and what you took away as an investor that entrepreneurs would find useful to know. All right, uh, I, I have one. This is a, well, it, the funny is that you know which side of the table you're sitting, at, right? And uh, this is a, a collaboration with an American-based company, and uh, we have everything ready, and we have the uh, chairman of the company uh, flown in from. China and ready to officially uh, sign the document. And uh, it's, uh, we have everything ready, you know, the, the, the cheese platter and the whatever those, and the champagne on the ice, everything, you know, just. Uh, and then uh, someone just, uh, you know, champagne, uh, nameless, and then started reviewing the third party agreement. You know, this is uh, something you just, you know, uh, gosh, uh, everything is all fine, and 
and uh, we will have the rights to develop and uh, commercialize all this. And then you start uh, reading into the third party agreement with, uh, uh, at that time, it should be uh, CRO of the uh, potential partner. And then there is some language just starting to sound more and more alarming. And then just the, the, the deeper you read into that, you know, all of a sudden you realize you're just gonna give away uh, several million dollars for nothing. You cannot actually have that. because the, the, the company uh, they don't have the rights to authorize this. Do you have to rely on the uh, the, the CRO to, to you know to really they have to have the final say? I don't know how who negotiated that third party agreement. But the, to cut it short, it's just like all oh, for nothing. That was just. I would say truly a uh, uh, big F on. So I have a pretty funny one here. Like, uh, I won't name, uh, I won't, they, they, so they, whenever, uh, I'll be frank about it, whenever most Western companies see Chinese companies, they see dollar signs, right? It's like, oh man, these Chinese folks must have a lot of money, right? Since they're buying this, buying that, they're LV bags, they're like $5,000 Chanel bags, like, oh Jesus Christ, right? So um, uh, there's a, there's a, there are specific areas where if you if you're a Chinese buyer, I'm I look Chinese. I'm born and raised in California. I mentioned earlier, they see me and they say, oh man, so I, this is going to be dumb money. It's going to be an easy deal. And they come up. It's a company with a preclinical medical device asset, and they say we're valuing ourselves at 500 million U.S. dollars. Uh, after some good discussion, we're at 500 million. It's a great deal. You should buy us. Instead, just do your investment, just buy us straight out. And we were like, are you kidding? Like, okay, after after two months of talking, you're saying 500 million. Like, we know you're not worth that much, we're out, right? And then uh, a week later, they come back, no, 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 five, no, 250, 250, we'll do 250, that's our lowest deal. We'll give it to you for 250. Only if you buy us, 100% cash offer. No, still not a good deal. Another week later, they come back, 50 million. We'll do 50 million. Uh, 50 million and we'll give you everything. Uh, we'll even work for you for a few extra years. But I mean, come on, like, at this point, this is absurd. Like, I'm not gonna spend my time, this is not the negotiation strategy that I wanna work with, right? If any person comes to me with that type of attitude of negotiations, I mean, it's no go. I mean, on one side, you wanna maximize value, but that's not the best way to negotiate. But uh, I would say that, that that was one of the funniest cat 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 catastrophes that I've engaged. And it's very unfortunate that Western, Western not just Western, but uh, there, there, there are people that think Chinese people purely have money, and it's just dumb money. Uh, uh, these money, this money is it was easily made elsewhere. But blood, sweat, and tears, right? Money anywhere is blood, sweat, and tears. And we'll still be looking for right deals at the right markets. And, uh, and even if your product is great, if your valuation is there, we'll walk away. I mean, it is what it is, right? Uh, but if there is value in the long run, we'll definitely look closely at it. But just please don't go from uh, a high number to something, oh, Jesus Christ. No, no, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'll stop there. So I don't know if it's a funny one, but it's one of the, uh, uh, the deals we did was an Australian company and uh, brought over a consultant to, uh, to me. He, the, uh, the chairman that I deal with, he, he, he controls his billion dollar empire from his bedroom bring in this Australian guy and he uh, he said oh we'd like you to consult with us we need you to be here 10 days a month he said well, I can't I have a company uh, in Australia to run he goes how much is your company he ended up they ended up buying the company but what they did and what they had done on numerous investments they always wanted a controlling stake and the biggest mistake I think you can make in a startup is to take a controlling stake so we would Come in and we started out at 66, and then we ended up at 85 percent. The uh, that, that founder walks away with you know many millions of dollars, and is completely unmotivated to be involved. Um, but they still thought that he should be running the company. But yeah, he's like, well, you, I've I've cashed out. Why am I still here? I get like a tiny little salary, but I've got all this cash. They had control, but they didn't they didn't realize that they had control of. Without the founder, there wasn't really much to have control over. So that was kind of a, a big, a big learning for us. So now we we won't do anything more than maybe 26 percent of 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 something. 
Um, you know, and it's, it's, again, it's a cultural want is we want to control this. We don't want that guy to take advantage of us. We want to control it. But if you try and control it too much, then you end up with absolutely nothing and demotivated people. Um, I, I'm somewhat constrained uh, by virtue of the fact that the man who signs my paycheck is sitting in the second row. Um, and uh, the biggest disaster we invested in um, by virtue of having been half asleep and reading an email in the middle of the night on a conference call, I'm now running. So uh, my advice is when you do these middle of the night phone calls, don't read email while the conference call is going on. Don't watch the news and pay attention. And I'm getting the high sign that the cocktails are coming soon, so I, I want to open this up for questions for a few minutes. We have a couple more things we can talk about if you guys don't want to ask anything. Um, but uh, you please, if you have some questions that you want to the panel or to a specific <coughs> member of the panel, just throw your hand up and we'll be happy to take them. Sir. So a few years ago, I was running a company that had a technology for interventional radiology. We were interacting with a Chinese company that was very interested in just buying the Chinese rights to it. Um, that was a few years ago. I'm aware of you know, some transactions lately where the Chinese entities are buying the entire US operation. Is that a trend that you see continuing, or do you think there are exit potentials where you can kind of carve out China, depending on the situation, and then retain the rest of the world? I would say the short answer is case by case, and uh, it depends really uh, the, the, where the market is, and also you would really like to look at it, and whether the company has the capability of taking it globally. If they have the infrastructure and wherewithal to, to materialize it, uh, by all means. Otherwise, you know, it's just going to sit there and waste it. This is almost on the flip side of when you're doing business with a large pharma, and they always want the global rights, and then they have no interest or the uh, capabilities of going to China and then that part of the uh, value is just never being materialized. So you have to look at it, uh, whether or not they can do it. It's uh, not a matter of they want to do it. So if I can add one quick comment to that. So uh, nowadays, so uh, I would say pre-2016, a lot of the deals were uh, I'll license the product from you. Uh, Western medical device companies, unfortunately, uh, due to the U.S. Uh, U.S. finance situation, uh, less U.S. funds are supporting medical device companies. Japanese companies have caught wave of it. Chinese companies have caught wave of it. Um, I'm not sure if the, the, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen it as well, which is now they do investment for uh, they do a certain investment for China rights, right? Uh, so they get to double dip, so to speak. Uh, in terms of acquisition-wise, whether or not I think uh, uh, it was uh, Larry nail on the head, which is, again, first off, case by case. Second off, it's also who are you doing the deal with, right? So frankly speaking, like, the, I've known Larry for quite a while, and Folsom in general is a great organization. They, if, if Folsom wants to come, come acquire you, they have to do it as quickly as possible, right? Actually, I pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, you don't pay me enough, maybe you pay me more, right? But, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so the, but that being said, it really is dependent. And a lot of these Chinese companies, they say, oh yeah, you look great. So uh, part, of the, part of the stupidity of things is some Chinese companies will come in and say, hey, 500 million, I'll do 500 million. And then, it dis and then, they, then not, not only do they not transfer the money, but they completely disappear off the face of the earth, right? So, like, uh, so, so there are issues there. So, so be cautious on who you work with. Uh, go, going back to trusting, trust who you work with. And also, uh, is it a possible exit strategy? Certainly, if it's a company like Folsom or other large reputable. Yes, sir. So with regard to a U.S. company wanting to do a deal with a Chinese partner, how do you feel about the pros and cons of actually setting up a true joint venture that's, say, 50-50 owned with the China rights, as opposed to just granting the China rights over to the partner in exchange for royalties, et cetera? How come I feel like, you know, I have a you know, bullseye on my hand? <laughs> uh, thanks for the question, yeah. Uh, again, this is uh, also depending on the, the situation. I, I, Give you an example, you know, Fusan has a, a joint venture with Kai and CAR-T. And the reason you have to do a joint venture is there's regulation prohibiting any genetic information from coming out of China. You have to do that. There's no other way. 
but you know, for other things, you, know, they, you could easily buy it if just granting the rights because uh, uh, that might be the uh, easiest way to go with. And uh, being the second largest uh, uh, pharmaceutical company or group based on the market cap in China, uh, Fuzhou really has a big platform to do a lot of things, but uh, they also have a lot of experience in doing that, in evaluating what's the best approach. They are, in a way, they're entrepreneur, entrepreneur and also very experienced, so they can find the best approach when you get into uh, discussion with them. That's uh, my experience, and uh, uh, don't want to hog the mic. <laughs> Yeah, I think it depends on um, your, you know, as the, yeah, as, as maybe the U.S. startup, you know, your particular, you know, situation and uh, and, and and inclination, right? Uh, first of all, uh, in my in my experience, yeah, 50-50 joint venture is a bad idea because then, yeah, I've been in this room before you get that long, you know, so better that somebody is 51 and someone else is 49. Either way, you know. Um, yeah, probably in a joint venture situation, the uh, U.S. startup needs to actually be more Kind of physically or you know into yeah physically involved you know in, in, in actually the, uh, the, the 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 operation uh, maybe joint venture could make sense you know if uh, you would have some kind of mechanism that yeah we've been in such situations before in fact we're in one such situation right now so um, if you know the uh, there is potential still for one down the line some kind of global exit right and then you want you do the joint venture and then you have a way to then swap out the uh, local Chinese partners equity up to the parent company level. Obviously, this is treated as a foreign investment, so uh, certain uh, approvals may be needed. Um, so you could, you know, kind of develop it, you know, and then they fund it locally, and then yeah, develop it locally, and then you are getting involved, and then if there is a global exit, then you know, like everybody gets, yeah, the Chinese partner get a big upside as well. You have some way to, you know, flip them up to the uh, to the holding company level. Uh, so if yeah, I, I think yeah, if there are yeah, in one one instant, one one answer maybe that yeah, if there is such potential for global exit, then maybe it would make sense if you're also going to get involved physically, you know, in, in this venture. Again, yeah, don't do 50-50. But if not, right, if you just need the cash, then why not just license it out, right? And then maybe you figure out that eventually your exit is. I mean, you obviously can still come up with a situation where or, or some kind of mechanism where you can buy the rights back in case of global exit. Yeah. So I think it depends on your situation and your final eventuality. Yeah, uh, when, when we think about it um, a lot, it, it, it's very sector specific. Um, we haven't had the experience ourselves, but we've seen people who had where you lose control of a Chinese partnership. Um, they and it can happen anywhere, but but China's the biggest market. And if it's drug in particular, you're liable for the disaster of the clinical study in the U.S. Right? You know it, and you can't disclose it. And if you've lost control. You know it and you have to disclose it. And then you lost control in a non-functional joint venture or a license. Um, it's less common now than it was 10 years ago, right? But there's an old sort of in drug development, never do an experiment you don't want the answer to, right? And if you don't control your, your asset, then someone's gonna do that experiment on people. And, and then you own the data. So those are the things that we worry about, not about how much is it, but it is, is can you maintain control of your asset in a way, not so much because you want to own it, but that you can prevent a disaster. Um, and less so in devices and diagnostics because it's sort of, they're different and there's variations and it's not the molecule, but, but, but we worry about some of that stuff where people get greedy. I think in general, the, the advice that I have is um, even in a U.S. company with a U.S. focus, we almost refuse to invest if they don't have a strategy for Asia because it implies that they're stupid. Um, which is usually a bad thing in a management team. Um, not always, but, but most of the time. Um, but we're very cautious about using early stage money to actualize that. So having a plan and having thought it out is critical, but if the use of proceeds is to go build a 200-person sales force in China, that gets you a lot of stupid points also, right? And, and they're pretty easy to dispense. There's a lot of good places to find them. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, if not, we'll do some closing thoughts. Okay, just quickly in a, in a fast round, best advice you could give people when they're coming to you for money? You really have to invest in the relationship. 
give us a little valuation. <laughs> and God, we trust all of us bring your data. Uh, for India, you've got to think long term needs to also work in the short term. Uh, when you're pitching to us and you think that we're typing on our computers answering emails, sometimes we're actually taking notes. So please remember what you told us the last time you saw us. Thank you all very much. Thank you guys for staying. It's, uh, it's been fun, and I hope you got something out of it.